We're going to do a discussion on NAT, Network Address Translation. Network Address Translation is fundamental to most home routers, small business routers, even in large enterprises. And basically, it's a way to map an entire network of, of computers that are, have been given private IP addresses to a single public IP address. Now, this is typically found in our home routers, maybe even a small business router. There are other variations of NAT that allows you to use a pool of public IP addresses and still map to a whole bunch of private IP addresses. So NAT is very, very fundamental. It has really made IP version 4, has extended its life so that even in 20... Uh, 16, we're still using IP version 4 because NAT has saved the day. We've been able to use private IP addresses like these, 10 dot numbers, and 72.16, and 192.168. These are a whole slew of private IP addresses that can be used behind a router, behind a NAT table. So you can use them in your enterprise. Orange County Public Schools, for example, uses a 10 dot number that gives it plenty of IP addresses for its entire local area network. And then it can use NAT to use a pool of public IP addresses so everyone can have plenty of IPs. A lot of business routers use uh, the 172.16. We will actually see some of those. This is a small business Cisco class router and generally these type of routers will allow you to use uh, 172.16 um, to configure your internal LAN. Very few people need 65,000 IPs which is what a class B would give but it's there you can use it it doesn't matter because what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these private IP addresses and we're going to use NAT to allow us to use a single public IP or a small pool of public IP addresses so our company company personnel can surf the internet. Now, 192.168 is the predominant choice of small home routers. So most of us at home are going to be using uh, a 192.168 IP address scheme. That's a private IP address scheme. And we're going to use NAT to translate that to a public IP address. So let's get started looking at NAT. Notice this router, just like a home router, gets a public IP address from its ISP. So whether you have Bright House, AT&T, um, CenturyLink, or wherever you live, you're going to get a pri public IP address to the WAN side of your router. That's the IP address that can really go to the internet. On the inside of your local area network, you're going to get a 192.168. You're going to get a series of private IP addresses. What NAT does is takes every packet that goes out. For example, here's a PC that has a address of 192.168.1.2. And it wants to go to a web address that is public, 65.1. 181.154.141 but it can't this source IP which is on this PC is not legal in the world of internet it's private it can't be routed so what NAT does is it takes this address out and replaces it with the public IP address it simply takes it out puts another one in and off that packet goes so here it finally gets to its destination uh, of the 165.181.154.141. It gets to the website. So the website returns the information and it's going to go to 31214.2.45, which is the public IP address that was given to you by Bright House, by CenturyLink, by whoever is your ISP. Then the NAT has to do the translation take this information out because now the web server has responded put back the IP address of the the originator and then the packet goes to the PC so it's just as simple as that NAT simply removes the private IP address 
reinserts a public IP address. As the information returns, it does just the opposite. It takes the public IP address, puts in the correct private IP address, and your web surfing goes very, very smoothly. There are lots of great pictures and graphs and, and charts that show NAT. Uh, this is one that I found on Google Images. It's very good. Again, it shows you a little bit of the internal table, how it works. Here's the private side of your local area network. And you can see we've got private IP addresses, 192.168. And out here are going to be public. And in this case, we have one public IP address. It's a 203.31.220.134. And that's very common, getting one public IP address to your router. NAT does the magic of taking every packet and replacing your private IP address with a public IP address and sending it out to the destination. And when it returns, it does just the opposite. So it's not a complicated technology. Just about anyone can kind of get the idea of it because NAT has to inspect every packet, interrupt it, open it up, change an IP address, and do that when it comes back. There's actually a performance hit because of NAT. So here you see you have a gigabit WAN port. We have a gigabit LAN port. But because of NAT, we lose a certain amount of speed from the WAN connection to the LAN connection. So be aware, anytime you modify a packet, you have to put a service in between your traffic. You're going to take a, a performance hit. In this case, this, this particular router does indicate that there is a slight degradation in speed because of that. This is my home router. And I was amazed that there was nothing. I went through the advanced settings pretty thoroughly and there was nothing about NAT. So in some routers, you may find that you can enable and disable NAT. There's very rare situation that you don't have NAT enabled. And in fact, on this trend NAT, there's no option to turn it on or turn it off. There really isn't a need to do that because everyone's going to use private IP addresses and going to need at least one public IP address. So you'll find that some routers will have an enable and disable. There's not much else to do. Most of what we're going to be doing is in the firewall and things of that nature. One last feature of NAT that we're going to discuss is called port address translation. It is typically known as an extension of NAT, typically a part of the way NAT works in a lot of routers, especially home routers. This is where we, we do just exactly what we've already talked about, where an IP address, you can see here in this case, a 192.168.1.101, from this PC, there's a process and it's sending a packet out. And what we're going to do is we are going to change its internal private IP address to a public IP address, which is given to it by the ISP over here. But we're also going to assign a port number. So if the traffic is TCP, it's going to be um, given a new port number, and that will help the NAT table keep track of multiple streams. For example, here's another process out of the same PC, host A. It's same IP. It's going to need a public IP translated into this traffic. But notice it's going to be given a different port number. So even though we're doing the same thing with this, let's say this is Chrome, and this is IE on host A. You're doing two things at one time. Uh, allowing the extension called PAT, we can actually assign port numbers so that the traffic can be separated. And we can still send the traffic out with a public IP and a unique port so when the traffic comes back, it sees this port number and knows, okay, this particular traffic that came out goes to Chrome. And this particular traffic that comes back, because it's port 42,156, goes to IE. So port address translation is sometimes called NAT overload. So a lot of words, a lot of acronyms, but you will see occasionally people talk about NAT and port address translation together. And in many cases, home routers, small business routers use this a lot.
Not every application running on your home network will like NAT because of the way it manipulates the packet. It actually changes every packet that goes out and comes back in. And some services don't like that manipulation. So there is a way of what we call NAT transversal, a way of bypassing some of the packet manipulation that services don't like. So here on my TrendNet router, I'm actually in my firewall, and if I slide down, you'll see I've got a setting called ALG, or what's known as Application Level Gateway. And this allows me to check boxes if I want certain services, such as email, this is POP3, SMTP, streaming uh, media, if I'm going to use some kind of uh, media service, also voice over IP, certain types of FTP, uh, and TFTP and remote control and things of that nature, and VPN. These are various applications that may or may not play well with NAT because of the way they operate across the internet, the way that traffic is looked at and when packets are modified, they can actually cause these applications to stop working. So we have this, which allows you to enable or check these boxes, and you can allow these application services to go through what's called an application level gateway, which is also known as NAT transversal.